this is a house to house, father to father thing. And so what can churches do? Number one, we got to tell the truth that the media will not. Yeah. There's, there's truth that is not being disseminated by the system that is supposed to do that. Journalism is supposed to simply tell the story I was not there to see. Yeah. And they're not giving us the full story. And, um, and, and really, the only other group that can tell that truth and, and trusting in a trusting manner is the pastor, yeah. is the body. And welcome to the narrative for our seventh and final episode of this, uh, this little volume we got going on right now. My name is Aaron Bear. I am the president of Center for Christian Virtue here with my co-host and friend, David Mahan, our policy director. Dave, uh, I got to, I mean, we, we've been telling this story all day um, because uh, this week we, we, we shook up the uh, Ohio politics world um, uh, in, at the state house. Uh, and, and when I say we, I mean conservatives and, and Christians at the state house uh, when, uh, and I will say, I know for a lot of folks, uh, this might sound like super Ohio politics in the weeds. Um, but I, it's one of these things that has such a lesson for the country. Um, when a guy named Derek Marin, state representative from, uh, from Toledo area, good friend, um, conservative guy, uh, kind of the, the, the dark horse candidate, if you will, for speaker of the house, uh, he shocked, uh, all things Capitol square and, and won the speaker's race. Um, and the, the best way I could put it, and I'll say it was between Derek and two other guys. The other two candidates are, are friends. They've got great conservative voting records, Jason Stevens, Phil Plummer. They're good guys. Yeah, good guys. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of the folks around them, they had a lot of lobbyists and a lot of, you know, the conventional wisdom folks that you need to have to be the speaker, big campaign staffs, all that kind of stuff. And some of those are good friends too. Um, but Derek ran a, an entire speaker's campaign. Um, both fighting for his own seat because he got drawn into a bad district, um, but also um, helping other candidates and running a speaker's campaign on the issues, um, saying, hey, we're going to pass the backpack bill and we're going to pass SAFE Act and we're going to you know, move conservative policy and, and empower members to have a voice. Where a lot of the other teams were built on, hey, we're going to give you this position. You, you'll be in leadership. You'll have this committee. You'll, you know, that's the, typically the way you go about building your 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 team but that's not what Derek did and uh and Derek pulled it out last night in um one of the most amazing days I feel like I've had in this work uh, and got to spend it with you uh and and our board chair David Myhall um but I don't know David like what I'm trying to tell people about this like it, it <laughs> that's right. like even just that it feels like oh okay so that sounds like, but it's such a massive big deal that yeah. like uh, yeah I, I don't know it, it was a Cinderella story I mean I, I remember uh, election night right mm-hmm. so we were all looking at these members got a bunch of really amazing freshmen in watching their uh, campaigns and I happened to look at uh, Derek Marin I mean this guy was in literally two votes away from uh, his his competitor. And uh, if, if that gives you any idea of how close this guy, I mean, it's, he, he was the number one pick, not just because he's a good guy, he's conservative, but the team that he had behind him are proven conservatives. They, these guys have put their necks, their families' necks on the line for bills that protect children, that, uh, that just put them in, in harm's way, literally. Um, and to see this guy win last night, and really to see you in, in – uh, Chairman Myhall, uh, just lose your minds. At some point, I think one of you may have jumped up in somebody's arms. I, I just, I, I, I'm not going to, it's blurry. It's blurry. It was late. <laughs> so I'm not going to. It was, to, <laughs> it was it, like, yeah. I, so, so two things here. One, you know, getting involved in a speaker's race like this is not something that CCB has typically done because, you know, our view is whoever wins, we're going to work with them and we don't want to, you know, um, you know, close that door off. But we saw, and actually what we're going to talk about today is going to tee this up. This will, this will tee it up really well. You know, we saw these next two years for CCB and for Ohio um, uh, to be a real opportunity to do some huge good. Yeah. Um, and, you needed in order to do something like the backpack bill, right? Which is massive education reform. Um, you need a speaker that's going to be 
that's going to drive it, right? So you have Senate President Matt Huffman in Ohio right now who's made a, uh, a commitment to pass the backpack bill if the House gets it over to him. Um, we have a governor who's been pretty good on school choice. You know, he, he's very cautious with, with big reform things like this. Um, and so you really needed to have somebody that's going to drive it. And so that's why we got in all in behind Derek. And uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, what the, 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 first of all, we have an amazing freshman class of lawmakers coming in uh, and getting to just talk to members about issues and what they care about and why they're there. And then, and really help people tune out all like this whole, you know, maybe that one of the the better contributions Donald Trump gave to uh, the political discourse, which has been very few uh, in terms of actual uh, discourse, um, is the idea of the swamp. Uh, because it it there's very few other better ways to describe what the political scene is like, where people get inside you know Capitol Square, and so much of their sense of what's right or wrong gets consumed by what's politically possible and what yeah. will this person think and will this lobbyist will be mad at me and this and and for for the house caucus to say we're going to put the guy in who's going to drive the issues best um was huge it's huge and and I think you know when I'm when I'm traveling around and, and like you said in the beginning Aaron I'm even trying to explain to my wife at 10 o'clock last night you know she had a late night too and you know, what, what all went down. It's kind of like you had to be there. But I, I think a lot of folks just don't understand the whole process, right? It's like yeah. we, we had a red wave in Ohio, and then, you know, all these Republicans, and, and a lot of them are really good folks. And like, yeah. like we said, uh, the other candidates were really good folks. But to some folks, it's a career. To some folks, um, you know, they're, they're trying to, to stay in power and, and, and influence. Um, and to some folks, it's, it started out, you know, issues and it's still issues. Right. And, and, and these issues are important to folks in the district. They're important down there. And uh, when I met some of these uh, just over the last six months or so, and I met some of the new freshmen coming in, they were so excited about issues and, and things. And typically what happens guys is that, you know, sometimes the conservatives, the most conservative of the, of the, of the group kind of break off, right? There's right. all these last minute right. deals that take place. And yep. sometimes, you know, the conservatives, the, the really ideological folks that got in there to, to really help kids or whatever, sometimes they take deals and, and we lose that influence. And so the, the person who's the speaker, they get to set, you know, who's the, the committee chairs. They yep. get to set who's the leadership and what, what, gets, uh, what gets a bill number and what doesn't, and when that gets a hearing when it doesn't. And yeah. so that's so important that we had Derek. Yeah, and when, when does a bill get moved to the floor for a vote, and when does it not? Right. I mean, it, it really is a, um, there is a, a the, the, the control, the impact that the Speaker of the House has. And again, I know everyone's watching right now what's happening federally with, with Kevin McCarthy. It, it's very much, you know, I, I keep hearing people say, well, what, what can Kevin McCarthy really do with, you know, such a slim majority and, uh, and you know, the, the Senate's obviously still under Chuck Schumer's hands and obviously uh, Joe Biden's still there. And, and the reality is, um, one, not just in terms of he'll be able to stop some things, but, you know, he just, you mentioned it, he decides committee chairmanships. Right. And in, in Washington, you know, in Congress, those committee assignments, you can do you, you know, the, the, like the Judiciary Committee that Jim Jordan's over uh, yeah. can, can subpoena people and bring them in before the committee and question them. Um, and and the, the bully pulpit it gives to expose a lot of these things, you know, is, is massive. And so, um, you know, I, I really just, like, and I'll just say personally, uh, and I won't dwell on this uh, because uh, it's even hard to put it into words, um, but I think if there's one encouragement that I'm trying to carry, and even this morning, I was like, I want to get back to that place. You know, yesterday was such a day of, of just feeling desperate for the Holy Spirit for me because, you know, I, we were looking on paper and looking at the votes, and I knew it was possible for Derek to do this, right, for, for, for him to win. Um, but at every moment, there was another call from a lobbyist or a lawmaker pressuring us to take a deal to— not push Derek Constant. through to vote. Like, I mean, just, and it was, it was, I was so desperate moment by moment to, and just the, the concept of walking in the spirit. And we prayed more yesterday. I mean, 
than than we I, I have uh, maybe ever in a single day of just like stop. We're praying right now. Okay, Holy Spirit's telling me to pray. Let's just pray. Holy Spirit's saying, like, should I, you know, uh, should I go take this hill or not? Nope. Okay, I'm gonna just stay and trust and wait. Doesn't feel right. We're gonna, you know, and, and it could get again some of that stuff you could get in your head and and all that, but just. I just personally had that experience of living and walking in the Spirit so much yesterday. And, um, you know, it, it is true that in our weak, when we are weakest, He is strongest. In our desperation, um, He comes through. And when we can just live like that would be a beautiful thing. It was a God thing. I mean, on our knees in the hallway across from the house chamber, yeah. um, it, it was definitely a spiritual battle. Some of the freshmen that I know personally who love the Lord dearly, yeah. who just happen to know different people and, Oh my um, gosh! Yeah, yeah like yeah. <laughs> what? What one story of one member who we had? We literally spent months talking to members about this, and there was one new member who just came in, who nobody knew, no one had ever talked to. I didn't even know what he looked like, and we were we had been talking to how are we gonna ever connect with this guy just to at least let him know. Yeah, here's here's the issues, and we're standing. You know, David and I and and our our chairman were standing there. And up walks a friend who we knew would know him. And we're like, hey, do you know this guy? And they're like, oh, yeah, I can, I can text him. And I'll tell him to come talk to you. And, and that was it. And we, yeah. we got his vote. Um, and, and it was just, you know, not pressing. And, and that, I think that was, if I were to say, and we talk about this a lot at CCV, and I think this is probably where, where I'll end this part, is just, um, the thing that makes us most dangerous and most effective at CCV is that our value is not found uh, at win or loss of the state house, right? Um, we wanted Derek to win. Um, like we said, we like the other two guys. We we would have, you know, from a from an issue standpoint, we would have still been able to to drive it, try to push bills through. It'd been a lot harder, but we we would have we 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 still would have had the opportunity. Um, but we ultimately knew our value wasn't found there. So if threats or pressure or things come in, we don't, we don't, I don't want to say we don't care, but it doesn't affect us the way it might otherwise, because we know our, 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 uh, our, our hope is built in not, on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. And, and I know you said that was the last thing, but I, as ah. you keep talking, I keep, you know, we come down pretty hard sometimes on certain members, yeah. but when you see them tear up, you know, because they've been fighting and fighting and fighting for two years you know, trying to get good bills passed, quality, trying to help kids. And it's just come up against brick wall, against brick wall in a red wave, you know, state. Yep. Um, and they're weeping and, uh, and I'm, I'm tearing up with them, you know, yep. because, listen, not because we got Republicans in, right? Because all of them are Republicans. Yep. I mean, it, yep. it's because we got believers in. We got people who stand on the word in. People who um, put all of their political and relational capital behind folks who have a proven track record of standing on their biblical worldview, even at work. Yep. And, and, and now I got one more thing too. We're, 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 we're never going to end this segment, but, but I, even as you're talking, David, it's, it's reminding me. And it's again, just such an encouragement. I, I, I said this at one of the churches I preached at during the election. Um, you know, you can't separate out what just happened with the speaker of the house from, from our prayer at the state house events. Um, so four times a year, four times a year, we do events at the atrium where we bring in a worship band and, and we just pray right for two hours. And we, we, and it's an actual prayer event. We're not right. It's not one of these prayer events where you come together and you eat food and you hear speeches and they say, thanks for coming right. to our prayer breakfast. Like we pray. <laughs> um, and, and people talk, people talk and share. And you preach the word. And we preach, um, and building a culture of prayer, um, both in your personal life and in, in wherever you are. Um, that's one of those things that it, 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 it's, it's, like, it's, it's like gardening or farming. Like you just plant and you, you water and you cultivate and the fruit will come. Um, and I'm so convinced that that's a part of this. And, and I mean that, I'll, I'll just even testify to, I think I've, I've shared on the podcast before, you know, it was probably about three years ago now that I read Tim Keller's book on prayer. And it fundamentally transformed my prayer life, made me, made me hungry for prayer unlike I'd ever been before. Um, and, and just the, the confidence that gives me moment by moment is it's hard to measure. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to take a, a quick break here because 
We've got a, a special kind of uh, 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 wrap up uh, for you on on this volume. Um, you know, I, I'm calling this my our, our slightly too early 2023 forecast episode, um, where we're going to be David and I both. Uh, we sat down. We kind of wrote out what are our three biggest storylines each um, that that we're going to be watching in 2023, um, and uh, we're going to kind of unpack those together with you next, right here on the narrative. Christian business owners today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. As corporate America and chambers of commerce fall prey to woke capitalism, Christians in the marketplace need an advocate to protect their First Amendment freedoms. As Ohio's only Christian chamber of commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to ccv.org slash cbp. That's ccv.org slash cbp. And welcome back to The Narrative. This is Center for Christian Virtue President Aaron Fair here with our policy director, David Mahan, uh, with a, a very special episode for you this week. Uh, we're calling this our, our slightly too early 2023 forecast episode. You know, typically you kind of get your, your like 2023 outlooks or your year in review episodes like after Thanksgiving. Uh, but uh, we are uh, we're, we're ending this volume here uh, and uh, and won't be back until uh, early next year with you. Uh, so we figured we, we'd get the, our, our, our sort of 2023 preview for you. And, and again, the thought here for us. Uh, is uh, what are those things in culture and politics that we're going to be watching next year, right? What do we think are going to be those major storylines, those major cultural shifts, political shifts um, that are going to be very impactful? And and the things that we're going to be caring about um, going forward, so, sort of the questions we might have about those things. And so what we're going to do is, you know, David and I each made up our own list. Uh, we're going to go back and forth. Uh, and kind of react to each other's thoughts here, and 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 share those with you. Uh, and I'll I'll get us I'll get get us going here, Dave. You know I think the that one of the big things uh, that I'm going to be watching for next year, um, because I think we are beginning to see this now, and it's something we've been talking about around CCV for a while. It you know this this general concept has really changed the the focus of our ministry in in many ways. Um, but it's the impact of, of Gen Z. Um, and, and what I particularly mean by the impact of Gen Z, I mean it's the, the impact of a generation uh, where 90% of the, the children have gone through hyper-ideological, um, quite frankly, Marxist indoctrinating public schools, right? Um, we, it, it's the reason why, you know, getting kids out of public schools and passing the backpack bill and doing school planting is so important for us because we can't act like this curriculum that's being pushed in schools on a systematic, massive basis is not going to have an effect on uh, the trajectory of our nation, right? It, it's something we talk about all the time, especially with, with some folks that might oppose the backpack bill, right? Uh, sometimes you'll, you might get some, some homeschool friends uh, that say, oh, well, we don't want to change anything with education because we've carved out a really good place for us to home educate our yep. kids. And if a lot of families are able to take backpack bill, you know, taxpayer-funded money to, to attend a private school, they might not homeschool anymore. And then the government's going to take over these things. And, and, and again, none of that has ever been proven to be true. But bigger than that, the thing I always come back with is, okay, so what is your strategy then to deal with the fact that Ninety uh, percent of our kids today, I mean, this is the data, basically nationwide, are in Marxist indoctrinating schools, um, and they never have a an answer because you have to have a massive systematic change to deal with that, right? Um, but so we we've known this ideological wave is coming our way, um, and if you look at some of the underlying numbers in this last election, um, you'll see that actually Gen, Gen Z's voting in a larger and further left way than any generation really before. Um, and so we're, we're kind of starting to live in that moment. Do you think, because I, you know, I, you know, a lot of people look at Gen Z different ways, right? Some people have lost complete hope 
for Gen Z. Uh, other folks have said, wait a minute, Gen Z is the most technologically advanced you know, group. They're, we've got young mil- millionaires like we've never seen before. Um, do you see, um, who, who is the rallying element of the Gen Z? How do we, how do we come out of uh, the fact that many of them have been raised up in these you know, indoctrinating schools? But how do you, you know, what, what turns it around? Do you see that it just com- completely goes downhill unless we have backpack and school choice? Or, you know, is it, what is the redeeming factor for Gen yeah. Z? You know, I, I, honestly, Dave, I think this is one of the hardest uh, questions for us right now. Because, again, the important thing when we're talking about a question like a generation, right, is you can't just look at, um, like a, a, a strategy, right? You have to talk in scale, right? Right. You have to about, talk about things that really reach a lot of people, like millions, tens of millions. Um, and that's, again, that's why what the left has done with public education is so big, right? You take over the universities, you indoctrinate the next you know generation of teachers, and then they go out and work in, in tens of thousands of schools and, and you have what has happened to our country today, right? Um, and so, you know, and, or, what, what else kind of impacts culture big is technology, right? Uh, things like TikTok, things like, uh, uh, like Instagram, these things like that reach massive amounts of kids and it changes the way they communicate, it changes the way re- they receive information. Um, there's actually a, um, as an aside, uh, there was a 60 minute story talking about TikTok. Um, my, my wife found this, she, I think she wrote something on, a, on it for the Colson Center um, that talked about how the American version of TikTok is very different than the Chinese version that. of TikTok. Yeah. And, and what I mean, the American version of TikTok is owned by the Chinese uh, government, uh, the CCP. But the, the, the TikTok that kids access in China does not allow all of this uh, pornographic, um, doom scrolling, and like just hyper political stuff. It's all educational. And by the way, it has like a time cap on right. it so kids can't spend forever on it. Like they pers- they purposefully made TikTok in America to be addictive and and ideological and mind altering, um, and and literally mind altering. It, it, it the studies showed like using that technology for that long changes the way your mind works. So, to your question, Dave, like what do I think um, like could change this? I I do think it has to be uh, the church thinking differently about yeah. how we disciple kids. Um, and I also think, and this is, the, you know, maybe the best thing we got going for us here. And I think of our, our friend Ruth Edmonds. Um, it's got to be the mama bears and papa bears, you know, yeah. rising up to defend their kids. But that, that leads to, to mine, right? Yeah. So my headline, distrust of government safety nets leads to national revival. Mm. I'm telling you, man, you know, and many of you out there um, had an opportunity, you know, the four of us here um, to run to your churches and do rise up. That message didn't just come because, you know, we needed a message. That, that's that been on a lot of our hearts here at CCV for a long time, including me. And that, you know, when the foundations are destroyed, what would a righteous do? Foundations meaning social order. I mean, you, you've had COVID, right, where we, we saw things running out of store, meat running out of the stores. And, you know, young people realizing that, that meat actually doesn't come from the grocery <laughs> store. Like that that was huge for a lot of our, our young people, right? Um, law enforcement breaking down, recession uh, hitting really hard. We've not even begun to see begun to see how uh, tough that's about to be. Just got the national report card, you know, to to see how broken down our public safety net of public education is. Um, all of these are more than headlines. These affect people and 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 can ha- affect people quickly. Section eight, right? Housing, where uh, folks still landlords are. Ten twenty thousand dollars behind on payments because Section Eight uh, doesn't have the staffing to do um, some of the the things that are required for people to get Section Eight housing and, and approve Section Eight housing. So when these things break down, when these safety nets break down, I, and I hate that you know present like a, a dystopic, um, um, you know, presentator vision of America. But when they break down, what will the righteous do? And I think that, like you said, Aaron, the body of Christ has to and will. I honestly, as as clear as I can see it happening, just like everybody else, I see it also from a spiritual standpoint, and um, and I'm excited 
about how the church will, because the church has always been the one to produce solutions. And, um, and I love the macro solutions of backpack and the macro solutions of, you know, we're going to stop funding um, the, the mutilation of children. But then also the micro, I'm talking to individuals, not just pastors of congregations, but multiple people within congregations just said, Lord, what can I do? What, when the foundations are being destroyed around me, Father, around my home, what can I do as your righteous, you know, righteous person in the earth? Uh, through the blood of Jesus, of course, not in our in our own righteousness, but but I, I see them hungry. I, I just got a, an opportunity to hang out with a bunch of guys. We did a little deer camp last week, and just hearing their hearts, you know, guys that from law enforcement, guys that are seeing some of the worst. I've been in public schools all my life, yeah. and hearing them talk about what's going on in the public schools, stuff I've never even seen in my city. Um, and the, the, the public safety net of the media is not telling us the truth about what's going on up the street from my house. Um, families, fathers, mothers are starting to see this and stand up and say, God, give me a vision and give me the courage to, to, to walk it out. You know, Dave, do you think, like when you think about this sort of distrust in institutions, you know, I think on the one hand, you see a, a good opportunity, like you're talking about, of people to rise up and, and do it themselves. I think you see in, there, there's also the real risk of a downside, right? Of, of you know, like just on, on its, its, its basis, like not having one place where we're all consuming news that's, that's honest and trustworthy, right? right? I think about the, the, the sermons I've heard you preach about CNN and Fox News, right? Um, but... Um, what would be your concern? I guess let's look at on the other side with right. this distrust in institutions. What What are the things you think the church needs to be directly speaking out against or warning from, uh, you know, from people going too far with their distrust, whether it's in media or government or or in other institutions? That I don't know, man. I mean, I and I I hate to say that on on the podcast. No, I mean, that, like honestly, yeah, that, that we're I don't is, know what the answer looks like other than the fact it's it's house to house. You know what I mean? When, when, when needs come up in the community, um, and, and honestly, you know, the, the day of the huge church, I don't know if that's always going to be the case. I'm not saying 2023, but I, I just, yeah. I see the solution looking a little something more like home to home, you know, friend to friend. Uh, I'm, I'm getting calls, and I'm, you know, I'm getting choked up even saying it. I'm getting calls almost weekly. They, they, they're, they're talking about taking my child, David, you know, um, I'm gonna just be real honest. I, I got a, I got a, you know, somebody hit me on Facebook about a situation and I said, you know, Hey, you know, school related backpackville.com. And, and they got frustrated with me. Right. Because it was like, listen, I, I, I love the backpack. Bill. I'm telling everybody, I sent the postcards, but they talking about like last week, CPS came to the house talking about taking my child over this gender stuff. Right. This is a house to house father to father thing. And so what can churches do? Number one, we got to tell the truth that the media will not. Yeah. There's, there's truth that is not being disseminated by the system that is supposed to do that. Journalism is supposed to simply tell the story I was not there to see. Yeah. And they're not giving us the full story. And, um, and, and really, the only other group that can tell that truth and, and trusting in a trusting manner is the pastor, yeah. is the body. And, you know, that, again, that, that flows real well into my, my second one uh, here, which is uh, of what I'm going to be watching next year. Uh, that, that is going to, I think, plays into, you know, the church is the one position to do these things. And I got to say, too, David, what, what, when you and I are saying the church, we are talking about ourselves. Yes. Like, I, I want to make this clear. Individuals. Because a, a, a lot of folks, it's super easy to bash pastors and bash, church, bash churches. That, that's, not, that's not what we're doing. No. And because because our posture here, and, and this is this is a big thing for me that I've I've always uh, said with you know I, I say this a lot to to uh, when we start talking about election integrity, which is um, if we're mad about cheating or about things going on in the elections that we don't like, um, if your solution is just to cry about it and point out, look, oh these guys are so evil and they're cheaters and all this kind of stuff. Um, that tells me you're not actually serious about um, about election integrity. 
Um, because if the problem is somebody else, that gets you off the hook from doing something about it. Um, like, if, if you're upset about election integrity, you, I, I, if, if, if I see you posting about election integrity and all this kind of stuff, I, I better also see you posting that, that you're being a, an election poll worker or you're being an election, right. election poll watcher. Um, because you're not actually serious about dealing with a, a problem that you're seeing if you're not putting your skin in the game. Right. And that's what, what we talk about the church. We're talking about ourselves, right? Um, and that's, I mean, that's a part of the reason we put Christian in our name at CCV. Um, but for me, one of the big storylines is we have a, a storm-ravaged, a storm-battered church right now, just culturally. Um, if you look at these last few years, and and Dave, I know you have felt this when, when you've talked with pastors in particular. Like, think about everything pastors have gone through over the last, you know, really six years. And it's been, again, and every generation has their challenges. But from a cultural standpoint, it's been a heck of a run, right? You had, you had the Trump and, and Hillary Clinton election, which was so divisive. And, uh, and just everyone felt overly politicized through all of that. Then you had COVID hit. Then you had all the BLM stuff that now you have a, a, a massive recession, right? I mean, it's, it's just kind of one hit after another um, in terms of just uh, wearing churches and pastors down. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm just going to continue to watch is what is the, the fabric of our— now I'm going to talk about the actual church congregations. What, what are the, what's the—, what's the the interwovenness, the connectedness of, of our individual churches uh, to hang together through these things, right? I, I, think, I think one of the things I really learned through, especially through COVID and, and just watching in, in the BLM stuff is how important it is to not be reactionary, right? And how important it is for, for churches uh, and pastors to be patient and to show prudence, right? Um, it's one of the things I actually love the most about the Catholic Church is, you know, if they're going to change anything about the Mass or if they're going to change anything new in, into their, it takes years of process. Because they're a church that's been around 2,000 years, right? They're, they're not one to, 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 to just make changes quickly. And I think a lot of times, especially in evangelical churches, we see something happening and we want to, you know, be ahead of it or we want to respond and we end up getting caught up in a cultural wave. Um, and 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 maybe do an actually some disservice to the gospel. So I, I'm going to be watching how churches kind of grow uh, from all of this. How how pastors and and groups grow in terms of being faithful to our our, our gospel centered mission, um, and and preparing for. I, I think Dave, what you and I have just laid out is how how desperately we need strong churches right now, and it, it's. You know, it, it feels a little bit like, you know, that, uh, I'm going to use a sports analogy that you won't be able to relate. I have no idea what I'm talking about. but Because I just do real stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does real stuff sitting in trees. Like, oh, literally, we go. literally I, I text him on the weekend, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, can you look at this? And, and he's in a tree. For True days. story. And, 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 then, and then on top of it, too. Like, it's like, oh, did you catch anything? No, I just sat in a tree for seven hours. Like, then, <laughs> then you just become a grown man in a tree house. Like, if you're not actually shooting at an ant. Anyway. Um, Thank you for joining us on the narrative. Exactly, we'll... exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't even remember where I was going with that now. But uh, you, got, you got me all. All right, all here, here's mine. So, yeah. so what, what is the church? What does the church do? So, I, pastors... A couple of pastors have told me um, only 3% of the body of Christ will serve in a pulpit ministry. And I think about that. Like, what do the other 97% do, right? And so, and, and, and so much of what we do as a congregation is, is in that building. It's in that structure. It's, it's for that organization. And I'm all for that. Um, I just feel like discipleship has to look a little different going forward. Again, you know, with all of the things that are breaking down, we're going to need some teachers to fill these church plants. I mean, these school plants. We're going to need a new brand of teachers. We're going to need a new brand of legislators. And, and hopefully that's what I kind of saw here in this last election is that, you know, there were there were some folks that tried to bully our, our brand new freshman legislators like they bullied everybody else down here in, in uh, at the state house. And these guys said, uh-uh. 
no, we stick into our guns here, you know, for, for the constituents to send us here. And that was so encouraging. So I, I do see that that, that is a role that uh, the body's going to have to play. We're going to have to grow up uh, into this new reality, um, um, really post-COVID that everybody's been talking about. Uh, I will say, though, um, looking at polling, just to say something encouraging, um, we talk here at the narrative a lot about gender issues, primarily because it is such a big issue in the state of Ohio with six, uh, over six clinics, I think, um, that, are, that are actually sterilizing children and mutilating children. But the good news is a lot of the national polling, there's five of them, you know, New York Times, Pew, NPR, Baldwin Wallace, all saying that the general pu public is, is turning back to sanity, okay? Um, so one of the headlines of 2023 I see um, is uh, sex change procedures um, being stopped nationwide. Um, we're seeing uh, the, you know, the whole medical malpractice wave happening across the, the nation or across the, the world. And now we're starting to see it beginning here with Chloe Cole and a couple other ones uh, here across the country. That is a big deal. Listen, not just because of the sterilization. This is an attack against the image of God, body of Christ. And um, just like abortion was in some of your day, those of you guys that are older out there listening, um, this, is, this is the image of God issue of, of our day. Amen. Amen. And, and I'm, I'm actually going to take that and, and, and throw it into my, my uh, third one here because we're, we're running out of time. But I think it ties in really well. And what you just said, Dave, um, how, how you talked about that issue is exactly what I think the church needs to be doing right now. For my third point is, how does the church go on offense right now? Right. When, when we're seeing, you know, when we're seeing all this darkness, we're seeing all these challenges, we're seeing a generation that is, you know, ha has just had more onslaught from, a, from the culture and, uh, and schools and media than, than ever before. Um, like, how, how, does, how does the church not go on our heels? Because I am wholly convinced playing defense is losing slowly. Absolutely. Um, we have to go on offense. And even what you just said there, Dave, which is you, you take a look at the gender issue and to, to, to take this and not just say, hey, that's wrong, but also to say, hey, you were made for so much more than this. Yeah. I, I was at a Bible study a couple of weeks ago, um, and we were talking about what is, you know, I, I, we, were, we were talking about some of the phrases that the left uses, like love is love. And, you know, just all the challenges kids are going through today. And, you know, I, I said, you know, really, I think the biggest thing you see kids dealing with, um, and this is, you know, quite frankly, this is a, a, a symptom of, of just the, you know, we, we forget this often. I, I'm, I'm saying this as I'm looking out uh, my window at the brand new massive Hilton Hotel that was just built here in Columbus. Um, like, we don't realize we, we forget easily how, how, how comfortable life is here. Right. And how much, how much of our basic needs are just met. Right. And, and, um, but we have a real generation and, and not just the Gen Z, but all of us that is struggling for meaning. Right. There's str like this whole identity conversation is just a conversation around meaning. Right. Where, where do I fit? Where do I belong? What do I matter? Purpose. What's my purpose? You know, th these are, these are, fundamental questions that kids are struggling with that that sort of a secular marxist worldview can't give an answer to and that's the that's the the beauty of this though right these are these are fishermen that need boats right like these are people looking for meaning and what does the church have to offer what is not just the church what do you and i have to offer people is right. real meaning uh in jesus christ and, and that's just to, to your point I, I love the way you talked about that you know these are we, this is an opportunity to talk about the image of God with people. And, and I, I see that across the board. When you, when you see, you know, we, we talked about this on here in, in our last volume about woke capitalism. When you see um, corporate America going super left, it's an opportunity to build something new and go on offense and build the Christian business partnership, right? And start them in other states. When we see education being super corrupted, it's an opportunity. I, we, I think, I can't remember if we shared this on here, but like, Westside Christian School, our first uh, school in a church that we started, um, we just, uh, we, we got some stats back from them. Like the church itself, so the school is doing really well. I think it's like 35 to 40 kids now. Um, so, but, but bigger than that, the church has just 
you know, blown up massively. Like they, they're all these new people coming there. A WANA program went from like 20 kids to 60. I mean, it, it's just, it's amazing by how they took what seemed like a really dark thing and they went on offense and God blessed it. Right. Uh, and so I, I, I see that as a major, how does the church go on offense? How do we go on offense uh, through all of this? Uh, and instead of being so dismayed, we see it as an opportunity, opportunity. To, to shine light. Revival. And, and and spark revival. So what you got last, Dave? Oh, that was it. Oh, that was yeah, that's oh, yeah. where I'm at. I'm eight minute. There you right? go. I'm right. eight uh, minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I gotta say, guys, uh, we feel like uh, you know can't thank our producer uh, Vince Tornero and Wesler Media and and Grace Rose, Claire Dyson, Mike Andrews, all our team here that helped make this podcast uh, go. Can't thank you for listening. Um, we've really seen some some great momentum. Uh, I think I shared with you guys uh, that uh, next season, um, you know, we did 21 episodes uh, this this year. We we were planning on doing 30, um, bringing in some 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 different types of uh, formats and segments, uh, just because we, we've just really appreciated the feedback. Um, and uh, so, if you've enjoyed it too, again, uh, those 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 reviews, those likes, those shares, those help us reach more people uh, and, and grow this this platform. Uh, we do this to the glory of God. Uh, you know, we we resisted doing a podcast for a while because uh, we didn't want to do a vanity project. We wanted to do something where we got to talk about real things um, and and hopefully uh, bless the body. Uh, and you know, I know David tries to do that real time. Most of the time, I just drag it down. I'll knock myself this time, Dave. You know, I can I can take. But uh, but we're grateful for you, and we'll catch you here next time here on the narrative.